Now we see that these kind of um, manuscript book covers that we have in the collection here in San Diego, you know, serve to call to mind to the practitioners such deep, extensive um, works of study and practice and literature. Um, these collections were kept in monasteries to be brought out from time to time to be seen. Um, and then, then after, um, after the opening of, or the bringing out of objects from Tibet, collections started to arise in the West, primarily during the 1960s and 1970s and also more recently. So Tibetan art came out of Asia at a time when, um, at a different collecting time than earlier Chinese Buddhist art. And so we see something very interesting. We see many displays of Tibetan art often done within more of a devotional context. And so we see often in, um, uh, uh, in uh, museums that Tibetan art here also when we had our Tibetan display and we'll be looking forward to a more kind of devotional shrine context for the Tibetan art that will be going on view at the end of the year, that Tibetan art more than other kinds of Buddhist art or other kinds of Asian art seem to be placed within a contextualized setting, um, like an altar, like a shrine, to call to mind the kind of practice that a, that a devotion, that a devoted practitioner, lay or monastic, uh, would be following. Um, and that may have something to do with the fact that m m many Tibetan collections came out of Asia relatively late. So our next speaker today, Keith Wilson, actually was in charge um, of the collection at the Freer and Sackler Museum at the Smithsonian Institution when uh, probably one of the most prominent examples of this um, contextualized uh, version of Tibetan uh, displays of art, the Alice Kandel Shrine was on view there um, in, in February of 2010, uh, which was a complete room filled with Tibetan art, sculptures, tanka paintings, um, to really bring to the West the vision of how um, works of art in the Tibetan uh, monastic and devotional settings um, would have been in their original context. At the same time, Keith was working on the exhibition that we have on view here at the San Diego Museum of Art that we are so honored to be in partnership with the Smithsonian Institution um, to have on view here today. And these objects point to a different moment in collecting earlier in the 20th century, at the time when the expositions were um, were dotting the world in, in the West, and there was an Orientalist fascination with Buddhist art, um, and many objects were brought as individual pieces, individual heads, individual hands, to adorn mantelpieces, or to be viewed as special curiosities within private and then museum collections. And so we see early Chinese Buddhist art um, that gripped the imaginations of uh, collectors in the West early in the 20th century, presented in a very different way. And our third and final speaker for today uh, will be sharing with us his experiences of the early collectors of Chinese Buddhist art um, from this um, fulcrum moment, really, in the West, uh, when Westerners were looking at, um, at bringing objects out of Asia into their own collections. Keith um, got his PhD from Princeton University and also a master's, just like our first speaker, Neville Krishna, um, in Chinese art history from the University of Michigan. He served as curator of the Chinese collections at the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where he was also in charge of the Korean collections there. And since 2006, has been um, heading up the uh, curatorial departments of the Arthur M. Sackler Museum and Freer Galleries at the Smithsonian Institutions in Washington, D.C. Hey, we're delighted to have him come to speak to us today. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I would like to extend my uh, sincere appreciation for um, the San Diego Art Museum for hosting this event and for inviting us. It gave me a chance to meet um, two speakers that I had never had a chance to meet before today, and so it's been enriching for me as well. Uh, my talk this morning addresses a specific span of decades in the late 19th and early 20th centuries during which groups of much earlier Chinese religious icons were recategorized 
as objects of fine art, and here it's capital F, capital A, fine art in the Western sense, that is painting, sculpture, and architecture, and thereby came to occupy a place in the Western art historical canon. In this process, ancient images that were created to advance political prestige, enable spiritual teaching, and focus meditation among Chinese Buddhist believers, all of a sudden became subjects for aesthetic displays in European and American museums. And we can see it right here in San Diego. In this radical shift, sculptural groups, such as you see in a Lungman cave in the upper left, lost their original context and individual specimens became subjects for a new kind of analytical sorting rooted in Western art historical studies of stylistic change over time. And here you see a group of disparate sculptures of various periods on display in the Metropolitan in 1925. Echoes of the Past offers an innovative contemporary attempt to realign original context and art historical study by focusing on one early Buddhist cave site, that is Shantangshan, developed in the late 6th century. I hope that the exhibition clearly reflects three different phases of work at that site. There is, of course, its original creation in the third quarter of the 6th century, which involved imperial and aristocratic patrons, Buddhist religious leaders, and experienced but nameless sculptors. There's also the 20th century phase. This is when the sculptures were removed from the caves, and Japanese and Western archaeologists and art historians studied and interpreted the caves and their sculpture, thereby establishing their relationship with earlier and later examples, other caves. And then, of course, there's the contemporary, the current, the 21st century effort to reconstruct the site given its 20th century history and to understand Shantangshan more holistically. Since the exhibition and its catalog provide a fairly clear introduction to the first and third of these phases, that is, the creation in the 6th century and the reconstruction in the 21st, this morning, I'd like to focus on the more complicated and messy phase. That's the second phase, the 20th century, when Japanese and Western archaeologists and art historians studied these materials that had been removed from the caves. Given the complexity of the story and the brevity of time I have this morning, I'll focus on three topics. I'll begin with a wide-angle view, literally, of the late 19th and early 20th century that reflects stages in the acceptance of Chinese religious icons as example of fine arts as defined by Western art historical canon. I will highlight three key international developments, moments in time in the late 19th and 20th century that chart the trajectory of this change. Second, I'd like to explore in a kind of microcosmic way, the view of the activities of one collector, Charles Freer, who lived from 1854 to 1919. His life directly overlaps this period of transition and change in collecting interests and are mirrored in his own collecting patterns of Chinese Buddhist sculpture. Uh, logically, these changes are reflected in the collections of the Freer Gallery of Art, where I work, which was established by Charles Lang Freer in 1906 and opened to the public in 1923 as a museum of the Smithsonian Institution. And finally, going from wide angle to microcosmic, finished with a kind of microscopic view, focusing only on the 13th uh, 13 examples of Shantangshan sculptures that are possessed by the Freer Gallery of Art. More than half of these works were purchased by Freer himself during his lifetime or his close friend Agnes Meyer. These were purchased long before the site was well understood. In fact, none of them were bought as Shantangshan sculptures, as you will see. 
A survey of the changing opinions on the dates and original provenance of these pieces will show how research on Shantang Shan was relatively late to develop. And in some instances, Freer sculptures were only attributed to the site through research generated by the Echoes of the Past project. So I'll cover these three aspects this morning. I'd like to begin with an introduction talking about the conversion, the process by which these um, sculptures created in the sixth century were converted into fine arts and became the subject of museum displays such as what's on view here at the museum today. I think the first chapter of this story can be traced not to China but to Japan and Japan's active engagement with the New World Exposition Movement in the last quarter of the 19th century. And what you're seeing here are a number of vignettes from a couple of different fairs. Uh, Japan first officially, unofficially participated uh, in an international exposition in London in 1862. And you can see here in its first attempt, illustrated in a stereopticon card actually, uh, a kind of vast mishmash of uh, folk art, um, everyday things, uh, just bits and pieces of Japanese culture kind of massed together in, in a display in London. Uh, in 1873 at the World's Fair in Vienna, it was the first official presentation um, sent from the Japanese government, much more orderly. They had done research. They had been told that large objects were important. They attracted attention. And they were also encouraged to submit objects uh, that would be considered of fine art value. Um, as I'll describe in a second, this led to the ultimate success in Chicago in 1893 of Japan being invited to display within the art museum, the fine arts venue at the Chicago World's Fair. In Japan, where the feudal government had prohibited contact with the outside world for centuries, the exposition era coincided in large part with a period when Japan was beginning to pursue international communication and commerce. Through participation in the expositions, Japan glimpsed the conditions and products of newly modernizing Western nations. By participating in the 1873 Viennese exhibition, its first official appearance at a fair, Japan became aware of the unexpectedly huge sales potential in the West for artworks, both old and new. In the following decade, that is the 1880s, extremely high quality works of Japanese art were displayed in international expositions, and the Japanese began to consider such fairs to be opportunities to inform overseas audiences about the exacting standards of Jap Japan's traditions and its resultant cultural achievements. At the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition, Japan brought, built the Hōden, a replica of an historic hall at the Byodoin, Buddhist temple in Uji, near Kyoto, as a way to introduce various phases of its traditional culture as different rooms within the structure were dedicated to displays of art from different historical eras. Japan also succeeded and having its fine arts and decorative arts included in the display of the exposition's fine arts venue. And you can see some examples of um, traditional Buddhist sculpture here and on the balcony above this European group um, set out below. Going to these world's fairs must have been a kind of kaleidoscopic visual experience. Through these efforts sustained over a period of 20 years, Japan succeeded in having its historical and contemporary painting, sculpture, and architecture accepted within the broadened international definition of fine arts. Publicly illustrated at the 1893 Chicago Fair, this achievement was viewed by an estimated 26 million visitors. The attendance figures at the World's Fairs are really mind-boggling. In the closing decades of the 19th century, Japanese interest turned to the historical origins of its newly christened fine arts, thus inducing Japanese scholars to turn their vision to China 
and initiating modern studies of Chinese and Indian art. As a result, Japanese scholars, collectors, and dealers began to promote research and collection of Chinese fine arts, including early Chinese Buddhist sculpture. One sy sy symptomatic example is Okakuro Kakuzo, who I'm showing you here on the left. He was a high-profile Japanese urbanite who had an international sense of self, a true Meiji man. Uh, a few years after graduating from Tokyo Imperial University, now Tokyo University, he was one of the principal founders of the first Japanese Fine Arts Academy, the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. About a decade after that, he was invited to Boston to become curator and thereafter head of the Asian Art Department at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Okakura was an effective spokesman for the importance of Asian culture in the modern world, a true pioneer in the late 19th century. And he helped turn the tide against overriding Western influence that had come to dominate art and literature across the globe throughout the 19th century. Among other things, at Boston, Okakura was able to acquire the first important, authentic Chinese Buddhist sculpture to be seen by the American public. Here I'm illustrating on the right-hand side, an important early 8th century 11-headed Avalokiteshvara sculpture that o Okakura bought for the Boston Museum on a scouting trip to China, probably in Xi'an, in 1905. Turning from the World's Fairs and Japanese engagement, which I think provides an introduction to the story, the second phase we move to Europe, uh, and especially to one very important publication. A second major milestone in the expanding acceptance of Chinese Buddhist sculpture as fine art in the West came with the publication of a book called Mission Archéologique dans la Chine Septentrionale. This was a sprawling photographic survey of important northern Chinese historical sites visited by the French scholar Edouard Chavon in 1907. This uh, text contained nearly 1,200 black and white plates. And here I'm showing you two that are distant views of the Buddhist cave sites at Lungman. The two volumes of images were published first in 1909. And they immediately made a number of sites that had before been unknown or known only in name uh, extremely well-known among Western academics and art lovers alike. In this pioneering attempt to define and interpret early Chinese art history, some of the subjects, especially the Buddhist cave chapels at Yunggang, Lungmen, and Gongxian, came to be seen as important landmarks deserving further study. Sadly, as a result of this book, um, not only was new scholarship encouraged, but it also unintentionally ignited wholesale removal of works from these sites as types of sculpture became famous by the book and became brands to embrace and objects to possess. So it, in, in a way, is a result of this book that the beginnings of the looting of Buddhist sites in China began. Uh, some individuals writing at the time in the second decade of the 20th century said that Siobhan's book was almost like an order catalog. People would circle sculptures that they liked uh, in the book and ask um, dealers to provide them for, for them for purchase. One result of these two phases is finally the recognition in the US of the importance of Asian art within the confines of an encyclopedic museum. The rapidly expanding influence of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, as well as the impact of pioneering publications such as Chavon's, can be seen in the contents of American museum displays and publications in the teens. So you can see things are moving very quickly. Chicago is 1893, Chavon is 1909. Here we're just in the teens. And already, uh, the Cleveland Museum, which opened in 1916, had a gallery dedicated to Chinese art. 
and the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia opened a new gallery of Chinese art, also in 1916. In the same year, the Metropolitan hosted a sprawling exhibition of early Chinese ceramics and sculpture. All of these events were accompanied by publications, and they're, in some ways, the most important important early publications on topics of Chinese art that were written in this country. Incidentally, 1916, the time of these two galleries openings and the exhibition at the Metropolitan, was also the year that Charles Freer, the pioneer and collector we'll be turning to in just a second, um, felt that he had enough Chinese Buddhist sculpture in his private collection to hire Langdon Warner, a Harvard-trained art historian, to complete a catalog of his collection. In a way, given the activities of Charles Freer, his life dates, uh, and the opportunities he had, um, he is a suitable kind of microcosmic representative of what was happening in the last decade of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century in terms of collecting Chinese Buddhist sculpture and notions about Chinese Buddhist sculpture. First, for those of you who don't know anything about the man, he was an incredibly interesting person. He was a self-made man. Uh, born in Kingston, New York, he decided not to finish high school. I don't want to endorse his decisions. Um, but he did have a very interesting life, even though he didn't even finish high school. He instead chose to go to work uh, as a business clerk. By 1885, he had formed a close bond with a man named Fr Frank Hecker, who was a former manager of a local railroad in upstate New York. The two decided to move to Detroit to pursue new business ventures together. Using their own capital and that of other investors, they formed the Peninsular Car Company in Detroit to build railway cars. The investment made them both incredibly wealthy as Peninsula became Detroit's second largest car manufacturer. By 1892, their company was Michigan's largest manufacturer. Freer uh, began collecting American art during this period in 1886. Not, I say, American art, not Asian art. But within a decade, that is, the early to mid-1890s, he developed a new interest in Asian art, chiefly East Asian art. To help educate himself, he took his first trip to Asia in 1894-95. People traveled differently in those days. That trip was 11 months long. And was, that time was chiefly divided between Sri Lanka, India, and Japan, although Freer did stop briefly in Hong Kong and Shanghai. From this point on, the experiences of the trip uh, allowed him to begin buying Asian art with growing confidence and ability, ultimately amassing one of the finest private collections uh, in the U.S. on the subject. The collection was promised to the people of the United States in 1906. It continued to grow until Freer's death in 1919 and became the primary holdings of the Free Freer Gallery of Art, which opened to the public in 1923. In terms of our subject this morning, uh, I'd like to look at Freer's collecting patterns in Chinese Buddhist sculpture. Although he had acquired some extremely important examples of Chinese and Japanese Buddhist painting by 1900, his early purchases of Chinese Buddhist sculpture appear quite tentative in comparison. And here I'm showing you two early examples in the collection. If you can't read from the back, the piece on the right uh, he acquired in 1903, and uh, the left and the piece on the right uh, he acquired in 1904. In the years before Okakura Kakuzo's appointment to Boston, and in the absence of research publications like Siobhan's, these were both purchased by him before either of those events, he may simply have not yet recognized the importance of the subject. The few examples he did acquire early on were clearly decorative in nature and were typically created in glazed ceramic, aligning them probably more with his early interest in that medium as opposed to 
uh, what would come to full bloom in his subsequent interest in, in Chinese Buddhist sculpture. In fact, 1909 was a major turning point uh, because it's in this year, which remember is the same year that Chavon's publication appeared, he began aggressively acquiring significant examples in both stone and gilt bronze. One of the first of these serious purchases was an early 8th century 11-headed Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, seen here in the middle of the slide, which came from the same set as the piece that Okakura had bought for the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, this was purchased in 1909. Freer, a couple of years later, bought another fragmentary example from the same set. You can see clearly that Freer is buying under the influence of the pioneering attempts at the Boston Museum. In the ensuing decade, until his death in 1919, Freer acquired literally hundreds of major Chinese examples forming perhaps the largest and most important collection on this subject in the West. And here I'm just showing you a scattering of examples, um, chiefly purchased in the teens. Uh, they range from all different time periods in early Buddhist art history in China. And although I'm just showing you stone examples, uh, he was collecting gilt bronzes at the same time. In this pursuit, Freer was truly a pioneer. In those early years, and he's really only competing with Boston, and the people in Boston were his good friends, it's a very tight little circle. In those early years, Chinese sculpture was only beginning to appear on the international art market. With few foreign buyers, large stone sculptures were relatively inexpensive compared to Chinese decorative arts. As an example, Qing polychrome porcelains were selling for between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars a piece, but a dealer could buy a head of a Buddhist image in China for a few Chinese dollars. The prospect of purchasing reasonably priced rare objects from an early period in a field that was just beginning to receive scholarly interest appealed to collectors like Freer. On the other end of the equation, for Asian art dealers, the possibility of comparatively large profit margins in a new field proved extraordinarily attractive. Thus, the prominent dealer C.T. Liu, shown here on the right, commented that the market appeal of sculpture encouraged him to, quote, develop a new line in Chinese art. In his pursuit of specific examples of Chinese Buddhist sculpture, Freer turned first to expatriate Japanese and Chinese dealers like Yamanaka Taijiro, who set up shop in New York in 1894, and C.T. Liu, who arrived in Paris in 1908 and later expanded his operations to New York in 1915. Freer also pursued objects through his established connections with dealer in, dealers in China, chiefly Shanghai, Tianjin, and Pe Beijing with whom uh, he had had a very um, strong correspondence network and whom he visited on two long buying trips in 1909 and again in 1910. You see Freer seated on a balcony in Hangzhou here during his trip to China in 1910. Although Freer was interested in acquisitions uh, on both of these trips, 1909-1910, his chief stated goal for the 1910 trip was a visit to several of the great Buddhist cave sites that had just been published by Siobhan. The influence of Siobhan's book on Freer's journey is totally explicit. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, a photograph of Freer's entourage um, preparing to make their way to the Buddhist cave sites at Lungmen. Uh, the connection between Freer's trip in 1910 and Siobhan's trip in 1907 is incredibly tight um, to the extent that Freer even hired Siobhan's photographer to uh, accompany his trip. So Freer uh, used the same Chinese photographer as Siobhan, and in some cases their photographs uh, from the two trips are, are virtually identical. Uh, I had hoped to 
describe this incredible experience that Freer had on his visit to the Chinese interior, one of the first uh, Westerners and probably the first American to visit some of these sites. But time this morning is um, somewhat limited. Uh, how am I doing? Oh, yeah, time is limited. But I will say, not to flog books, but um, in the Arts of Asia from last year, the September and October 2011 uh, issue, there was an article written by our archivist David Hoag uh, on Freer's trip. It's basically an illustrated diary of, of Freer's experiences. So as you read Freer's own words, you can see the, um, the emotional impact that a visit to this site had. Uh, you can see how this fits into, oops, oh, I'll put the book away. So this is all part of that nexus of activity in 1909, 1910 that really, um, I think, precipitates the, uh, the vast increase of his uh, collecting patterns. Unlike some collectors, Freer did not use site visits like this to help himself to the art that he saw around him in situ, chipping things off of images or off of walls. He only purchased art from established commercial dealers. Perhaps this is most charmingly illustrated by the only known objects that Freer ever removed from a site. And here I'm showing you those objects. It's a group of 39 river rocks that Freer gathered from the Yi River, which flows past the Longmen Caves near Luoyang. Uh, he lovingly had individual stands made for each of these rocks, as you can see from the example on the right. I'd like to conclude this paper by uh, turning to a kind of microscopic view that is perhaps most pertinent um, for this audience because it concerns uh, the group of Shangtang Shan sculptures owned by the Freer Gallery of Art. I'd like to offer two notes in advance. One, as will be seen, most of these sculptures were not identified as Shangtang Shan products when they were acquired. Instead, they were given very different descriptions and provenances uh, by different dealers from whom Freer acquired them. Second, these pieces are included in the catalog for Echoes of the Past, but sadly are not on view in the galleries. Uh, that wasn't just because we were snubbing San Diego, but unfortunately given the conditions of Charles Freer's uh, gift agreement with the founding of the Freer Gallery of Art, no freer objects can leave the museum. So if you want to see the freer Shangtang Shan images, um, you'll have to come to Washington. I believe he established this um, stipulation so that researchers would always know that freer objects they might want to study would be available in the galleries. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've arrived at a museum to study a piece and find that, oh no, it's in Indianapolis, or oh no, it's in Paris, uh, and so the trip has been wasted. I'd like to begin with a quick overview, and I'm sorry, not all of you may be able to see this, but I'll try to describe what's in, what's in this slide. It's basically a timeline that charts the acquisition dates of the sculptures in the collection. So here's the timeline beginning at 1900 over here and ending in 2000 here with the individual sculptures plotted on the timeline. In total, the gallery possesses 13 sculptures that are currently identified as originating from the Buddhist caves at Changtang Shan. This appears to be the largest concentration of pieces from the site outside Asia. The group includes two freestanding sculptures, and some of these you will recognize as closely related to what's on view. For example, this seated bodhisattva, which is very similar to a piece in your own collection. It says time's up. 
Okay, where were we? We're looking at this seated bodhisattva, very similar to a piece in your own collection, as well as this um, over life size standing image, um, which I'll say a little bit more about in a second. There are two monumental friezes, and by monumental, I mean monumental. They're uh, about 10 feet wide by about two and a half, three feet high. Uh, we were not even able to include them in our presentation in the special exhibition galleries because they're literally built into the walls of the Freer Gallery of Art and could not be moved. There are also five squatting monsters, which you will recognize as being similar to the one that's on view in your gallery, and four heads. So a range of types, full figures, fragments, religious uh, deities, as well as monsters. As suggested by this timeline, which sequences the sculpture by their date of acquisition, the 13 pieces can be sorted into three groups. The six works that were purchased by Freer himself, here on the left end, were purchased in 1913 and 1916 in two different groups. Appended to that is this one, which has got an acquisition date of 1968. That's because that is when Agnes Meyer, who is Charles Freer's closest collecting friend, actually gave it to the museum. Uh, we know that this was purchased actually under Freer's advice in 1915. So it really belongs over here, but given its date of formal acquisition at the museum, it's on the right-hand side. The two monumental friezes here were acquired in 1921, and they represent the first two museum purchases. Freer died in 1919. They represent the first two purchases made out of the endowment funds that he left to the Museum for Art Purchase. I think it's quite significant that they were the first official museum purchases. And then the last is these, the scattering of two pair of monster figures on the right-hand side that were acquired as pairs in 1953 and 1977. This table, and again, you probably can't see it, but this hopefully is visible up here. It's a summary of the whole. This table graphs the various commercial sources for the 13 pieces currently in the Freer. As listed in the summary in the upper right-hand corner, eight were purchased from C.T. Lou. We saw his photograph just a bit ago the dealer who had operations in Paris and New York. Three were acquired from Yamanaka and Company in New York, which I also mentioned previously. And one each was secured from two early European dealers. That's Dickren Kalikian and Marie and Rudolf Meyer Reichstahl. The relatively large number of pieces purchased by Freer from the Chinese art dealer C.T. Liu may suggest, and this is what I actually write in my essay in the catalog uh, that C.T. Liu may have been responsible in one way or another for most, if not all, of the early removal of figures and fragments from the Shangtangshan caves in the teens. Let's look um, briefly at the six pieces that were purchased by Freer himself, uh, because this is really kind of interesting. You see the pieces somewhat larger than you have in the last two charts. Um, now the sculptures are small again and the words are big, um, but it gives you a sense of um, how long it has taken for us to understand the Shangtangshan site and to identify um, pieces, both figures and fragments, that were removed from the place. This table summarizes the changing opinions on the date and sources of the freer pieces. As the first column indicates here at the left-hand edge of the chart, none of the figures and fragments was known to be a late 6th century sculpture from Shangtangshan when purchased by Freer in 1913 or 1916. Instead, most were assigned to the Tang Dynasty, which was much better understood and much better represented in Siobhan's book. Siobhan's book became the textbook and the kind of 
arbiter of, of dating and location of sculptures um, on the art market in the teens. Uh, and in fact, many of the pieces not only were assigned to the Tang Dynasty, but were thought to come from the Lungmen Caves, the largest group. I showed you a, a distant view of the caves from Siobhan's book uh, a few minutes ago. Several were related in the first catalog of the Freer Sculpture Collection in 1916 to somewhat earlier dates by the Harvard-trained specialist Langdon Warner. Uh, you, you all remember that the Shangtangshan Caves date from the third quarter of the sixth century. That is the late six dynasties. I put 6D because there wasn't enough space to write out dynasties. But Langdon Warner actually was um, fairly on target in his, in his dating assignments. Uh, for whatever reason, the staff of the Freer, Carl Whiting Bishop at first, curator and John Lodge, its first director, in their surveys of 1922 and 1924, prepared right around the opening of the galleries, um, didn't seem to accept the, the earlier dating that had been offered by Langdon Warner uh, and, and pushed them a little bit later, still falling uh, in large part within the early Tang Dynasty. You can see that this Confusion and lack of identification with the Shangtang Shan site continued for some 50 years. Tom Lawton, uh, a much later director of the gallery, made his own survey of the entire sculpture collection at the Freer in 1974-75. And only one, the Kneeling Monster, which was so well represented by examples at the Shangtang Shan site, allowed him to fairly confidently date that one piece to the Northern Qi and even to associate it with the Shangtang Shan site. The rest were still lost in a kind of no man's land of Sui or early Tang, that is basically um, early 7th century, 50 or 100 years later than the site itself. Here at the right side end of the slide, you can see the gradual association of pieces one by one to the site. But it's important to note that in many cases, these assignments were not made until the current, uh, the current century, the 21st century. So I, I think this is, is very instructive and shows the importance of the Shangtang Shan Caves project at the University of Chicago and the seminal uh, force of exhibitions like Echoes of the Past to precipitate this kind of serious review of museum collections, uh, focusing on date and supposed provenance. Uh, we were on much safer grounds with many of the other sculptures in the collection, things that came a bit later. Um, the Meyer Standing Bodhisattva, which belongs to the same group as the three on display in the galleries across the way, was published actually with them. Here they are, the Yupen Standing Bodhisattvas and the Yupen Prachiga Buddha. All uh, three of those were published with three other standing figures in an article, very brief article, almost an advertisement, in the Burlington Magazine in 1914. Uh, when Yupen bought their three, Mrs. Meyer bought uh, this figure, which, as I said, was given to the museum in 1968. Already by... Um, 1915, this entire group had been identified as coming from Shangtang Shan. They were, in fact, the core examples of um, Buddhist sculpture known to have come from the Shangtang Shan site early on. The two monumental reliefs that I mentioned um, were also understood at purchase in 1921 to have come from Shangtang Shan. So a, a growing corpus of, of elements were known, counterbalancing a lot of the unknowns that um, were represented by the freer purchases in 1913-16 that I showed before. The latter group, um, by the 50s and 70s, um, these were well-known types, and so they were acquired by the museum as examples from Shangtang Shan. 
I'd like to close with this uh, image. Since you can't see the sculptures themselves, you may not be able to accommodate them within the organization of the show here, which kind of moves cave by cave. You can see that the freer images really enrich almost every cave group from the site. Uh, I think this tells us a little bit about how the looting may have happened in the teens, that it must have been wholesale, very quick, fragments as well as full figures, um, and that activity was occurring both, that is looting activity, it was occurring both at the northern Shangtangshan site and at southern Shangtangshan. Uh, this plots the location originally of the four kneeling monsters, like the Cleveland monster on view across uh, in your special exhibition gallery from the North Cave, as well as our seated bodhisattva, your seated bodhisattva, and the seated Buddha from the VNA coming from this one cave. Um, two heads coming from what is the virtual cave, the digital cave that you have on display. And in fact, this head of Ananda is one of the orange heads that appears in, in the projection. Uh, the larger, more monumental pieces in the collection come from the southern caves. Uh, the two uh, reliefs, as well as the Meyer standing figure, the bodhisattvas on view, probably all come from Cave 2, which when you um, see photographs from the 20s and 30s, was virtually empty by that point. Uh, nothing was left. Uh, the two heads in the Freer collection probably come from the upper level caves. Uh, this head in the Freer collection, very similar to the metropolitan head that's on, on view in, in the galleries. So it really was through the Echoes of the Past project that not only did we redate these 13 pieces securely to the Northern Chi period, but through the research methodology of the project, we were able to actually replace them in their original settings, uh, thereby bringing this 20th century story uh, of some tragedy um, to at least some kind of a close. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask our three speakers, please, to come up to the stage. We're going to be uh, moving the table over and microphones for all three of them so that we can, um, and they can answer any questions that you might have or anything that you'd like them to expand upon a little bit. So while they're getting just set up, just um, some, a couple of thoughts just came to my mind. And it is about the extraordinary movement of people and ideas and art objects across Asia traditionally. We have Ken Rinpoche here who has come from Ladakh to Tibet to India, you know, to Varanasi in South India, then to New Jersey, Massachusetts, and San Diego. And um, in its manuscripts and movable objects, um, such as small, um, small uh, metal objects, and manuscripts like the book covers uh, would have protected, such as the ones he talked about there, that were really the vehicles for transmission of ideas such as the, the notion of the cave temple itself, which originated in India and um, the cave temples at Xiangtangshan are, are formatted and formulated originally based on um, descriptions in Buddhist texts and descriptions told by high-level Buddhist monks that were making their way from India to China. And then the, this incredible moment um, between probably about 1890 and then up until World War II, when, um, when Asia was open to the West with this kind of fevered catalyst of ideologues and historians and scholars from Japan, such as Okakura. Extraordinary what Okakura has done. He left Japan and went to India. And in India, he was in search of kind of a, an authenticity for a Pan-Asian unity of ideas in, that included Buddhism, a, spirit, a sense of spirituality um, that then uh, could be kind of united over and against the West, but also to not deny the West either. So he inspires Kumaraswamy in India to also go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts as its first curator 
curator of the South Asian collections there. And he was also linked with the circles of Tagore in Bengal, um, where Rai Krishna Das had um, commissioned works of art from the painters of the modern Bengal school, who were um, the leader of which, one of the leaders of which was Nandalal Bose, his exhibition that we featured here in 2008. Um, and so all, I mean, we see, and then also the textile artist that we have on view now, uh, Takaku Kuboku and his daughter. Um, he was a, his teacher was a, um, was a professor at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts founded by Okakura, um, struggling to, um, to uh, negotiate this kind of, and kind of transcend the contradiction of being part of modernity, a relevant part of modernity, whereas still preserving an authenticity that is distinctly nationalist, Eastern, and, um, and Asian, and Pan-Asian, in a way. So with those thoughts, um, I'd like to uh, open the floor up uh, to any questions from the audience if there are any. So what we'll do is, um, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, I will repeat it so that everyone can hear. And then um, just let me know to which speaker the question is being addressed. Yes, Norma. So the, the question is, um, I guess to Keith Wilson, um, has there been any pressure from the Chinese government itself to return any of the objects from Shangtangshan um, to their original locations in the cave temples? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, we were somewhat concerned about that from the very early days of this project with an exhibition in mind. Uh, unfortunately, the notion of having an exhibition about a Chinese site that includes no loans from China could potentially be incendiary or uh, controversial. Uh, the Chicago team that really provided the platform for all of the research shared in Echoes of the Past worked very closely with uh, their Chinese counterparts at the site as well as in Beijing. So there was a kind of collegial um, unity that developed uh, at the professional level, uh, with the Freer and Sackler being part of the Smithsonian in Washington. It was my job to make sure everything was OK with the Chinese embassy. And behind the Chinese embassy, the uh, Cultural Properties Bureau back in Beijing and all of the antiquities folks uh, in the capital. Uh, we asked the ambassador to provide uh, a letter of endorsement to the project uh, for the catalog, which he agreed to do. So I would say that going into the project with a great deal of sensitivity, both on the professional level and on the political level, um, helped us avoid that problem. Yes, another question in the middle? Yes. I'll just repeat the question, just so that everyone can be sure to have heard. Um, Neville Krishna mentioned that on some of the paintings uh, that he has noticed, or, or in some of the documents that he's found, that there are formulas for the mixing of the pigments. And, um, if, and uh, have those formulas been reconstructed and used in conservation or restoration efforts? Yes, it's a good uh, question. And we have actually three uh, resources. And uh, most of the time, we uh, believe in our oral tradition also. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that uh, I also learned how to make miniature paintings with the, the grandfather of that person for 12 years. So uh, we are very fortunate that almost 80% of the old tradition is still being maintained. And many times, curators like uh, maybe Dr. Sonia also get uh, confused if uh, one of us painted something and showed to her. And especially in Jaipur and uh, some areas, they are very excellent. So sometimes we say that they are much better than the old painters, one. The second thing is uh, we do find uh, there are two, actually, uh, uh, sources I, I've been talking about. 
One was we called, one is we call day-to-day -day diaries. These are account diaries. So my problem was when I was doing my PhD, because everybody was an art historian in my family, so people thought whatever I'll write, it will be just by them. So I have to find out some other sidetrack. And that I thought to tap these day-to-day -day diaries. So actually, I go to the day when artists were making. So you'll be surprised. Not only we know the, uh, the socioeconomic condition of that, what amount of money they were getting, what kind of provision they were getting, and what kind of land grants. But once they were assigned to some task, like one wall in one palace, they were supplied uh, a, a required amount of colors. So in that, we, come, we can know that, OK, this much uh, square they have to finish. And this is red, this is blue, this is this, this is adhesive, this is brush they have to buy for that project, which were bought by the code. And the third thing we find from the pigment. There are some pigments which are very, I mean, they are deadly for the paper, as you have malachite or something. And if we do pigment analysis, because every now and then they change the recipe. So I have got a record, which I am very hopeful that next year you will get in form of books, from about 200 years record when they actually ask for colors. And at the end, what we call these bound books as bahi, these leisures, at the end of each, we have miscellaneous pages where they would say, OK, how to make red, how to make uh, cheap gold, how to make silver, and these kind of things. And nowadays, uh, we are more relying on these uh, things for our conservation. Yes, a question in the front. <laughs> Let's start with one, and then we'll, we'll come back around to you. So the question is one of clarification of chronology of the looting of the Shangtangshan sites. Um, the, the photographs that we have, the earliest photographs that we have of the sites were taken by a Japanese photographer um, in 1922 and 1926. And there are quite a few uh, uh, elements of the cave temples that are still in situ in those photographs. Um, but um, there had been fairly widespread looting of the sites already occurring before that time, um, such that uh, Freer's collection was not acquired until, uh, it was acquired in 1913, so more than 10 years before the f photographs were taken. Um, and um, C.T. Liu uh, was getting them probably also around that time. So when wh when do you think, um, Keith, that the looting began in Xiangtangshan? And when did it um, when did it end? And how do the do C.T. Liu um, um, C.T. Liu's acquisitions, Freer's acquisitions, um, correspond to that general timeline also vis-a-vis -vis the 1920s photographs. Uh, well, C.T. Liu, Liu himself um, makes this pronouncement about launching a new line in, in Chinese art, that meaning uh, selling Chinese Buddhist sculpture in 1910. Uh, it's believed that the earliest removal um, probably begins at about that time, in, in 1910. Uh, the danger of um, the Japanese uh, photographs from the early 20s is you have to be very careful because it includes already restorations of missing pieces. So uh, about half of the heads that you see in those photographs are actually 1920s restorations already. Uh, just because there's a, a figure standing there, you can't assume that that's a 6th century figure uh, because restoration of the site seems to have been going on at the same time that objects were being taken away. Uh, whether the sale of sculpture was helping to finance some of the restoration work or reconstruction work at the site, um, we don't know. But uh, in the catalog, I published a, a kind of concordance based on what you can see in the photographs from the 20s and what you can see from the Japanese photographs that were made in the 1930s. And it's clear that half of the images were already gone by the visit of the, 
first Japanese team in the 20s, and that looting continued into the 30s, because their, pic their images uh, or elements, hands, heads, that appear in the, the early 20s images, and they're missing uh, in the mid-30s. So that uh, it made me believe that the core of significant looting, when all the major pieces, the freestanding pieces, all of uh, the most attractive heads and hands were probably removed between 1910 and 1922. Uh, looting continued thereafter. The reason why uh, I mentioned C.T. Lu, even though he was a, you're right, he was a relatively young man at this point, he was uh, one of the few Chinese dealers that was already outside. He saw uh, the interest developing in the West in 1908, 1909, 1910, the publication of Siobhan's book, then the blossoming of interest in um, Chinese stone sculpture that very quickly uh, took hold in Europe and the US. He was ideally suited to communicate that back to his, his offices in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, to secure material for the Western market, as well as for his, his um, dealership in Beijing. So even though he was relatively young, uh, may not have had access to a lot of capital of his own, he had very strong investors in Paris that were willing to underwrite his efforts um, in this area. So I, I think, I, I feel fairly confident that C.T. Liu played a, a pretty pivotal role at this site. Uh, the damage that was done was so uh, extreme that, as you could see from the uh, reconstruction chart, it really took almost the entire century to get Shang Tang Shan put back together again. Um, another question in front, yes? The question was, are the Maharaja families in India now? Um, are they still in possession of major collections of art, and are they making contributions to museums from their collections um, even today? For Neville Krishna. Yes, uh, they actually, uh, at one point, I tried to make a survey and found out that alone in Bikaner, there were more than uh, 10,000 paintings. And Mewar was Mewar and Jaipur were more prolific, but unfortunately, because of their uh, the ignorance during British Raj, and uh, because of many things, either many things were de uh, destroyed or sold out. So now, whatever uh, is left there, they are preserving. And there's another thing which uh, I initiated uh, to uh, by serving Maharaj of Jodhpur to accept uh, trained people in palaces, which uh, otherwise they were not doing. They were just were relying on their own uh, sardars. So now uh, there's a kind of race between each Maharaja to get some uh, you know, museology students or art historian to, be, to serve them. So now they are in good hands, more or less, uh, than 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So they are preserving, they are actually bringing ex exhibition as you have this Cosmos uh, exhibition for, from Jodhpur Maharaja. But unfortunately, they are not contributing to uh, other museums in India. So this is their own either uh, trust or uh, private collection. But uh, if, uh, you know, unlike uh, 50 years ago, they would rather give some pieces to National Museum or BHU or somewhere, that is not happening. Another question in the back? Uh, yes, you there, sorry. Is this a, a question about the Shangtangshan caves, the Chinese Buddhist caves? 
Okay, so I guess this is addressing all of our panelists then. Uh, the question is a bit about um, the artists and would it be one artist or multiple artists who would have produced um, carvings or manuscripts or paintings um, and in, the, in these various traditions? So, and would larger scale sculpted panels require a greater number of artists to work? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Neville, and... From him because he hadn't spoken anything. <laughs> And he's the most revered one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Genla, could, uh, do you have any, um, uh, any comments about how many artists would uh, be employed to paint a tanka or make a sculpture for a monastery? <coughs> men uh, tanka, is not, we have the men tanka painter one, then he or she is, has more uh, students. They're all involved. For instance, I order in Tibet, you know, 2018 uh, Tanka is called for him going to take, you know, two years. There may be details in the day, measurement. It takes long time, but then, you know, it, we have to use this, you know, particular, uh, the, what called, materials. Then also, the sculpture you know, takes more uh, long time, you know, the melting this, the, the, the copper, then you know, doing hand, hand, hand work is a long, long time, maybe, and almost big statues, it takes you know, years, you know, in, in, especially these days in South India, doing them. Nepalese sculptures. This takes me about one year if you do very precise details. So it depends also the tanka painter or sculpture, their expert and their skill. Some very expert with skillful takes lo shorter, the so learning is still longer. <laughs> And actually, he brings up a very interesting point that um, in the Tibetan Buddhist context, that monks also were patrons of these objects that would be used in devotional practice. And we'll often find in the corner of a tanka painting or one side of a, a book cover, a, a portrait of the monk who is the donor um, of the piece. Um, Neville, do you have a comment? Uh, if, if you permit, I can just give a very long answer, but it will cover many things. <laughs> we have eight minutes. Eight minutes. So just you give some signal, two minutes. <laughs> for. So there are many things, you know, and very strange thing uh, is happening because uh, nowadays I'm just trying to collect a lot of material for graduate and postgraduate school rather than scholars like these. So they would f have a feel of uh, all activities. So there are many uh, 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 contradictory things, like uh, we have our guru, Walter Spink. He has been working in Aj for Ajanta for the last 60 years. And he dis decided that everything was done in 10 years, something like that. And then here is my father and our, uh, we. We try to find out how much time painters took to prepare a, a manuscript like Kalp Sutra, Jain Kalp Sutra, or maybe Buddhist, about having about 150 to 200 pages. And you won't believe, we found out that within a week, they could just make entire manuscript with illustrations. So this is, uh, uh, you know, this gives uh, another answer. I mean, if we go for Akbar, P Akbar Atelier to uh, Maharaja Karan Singh of Bikaner, and we, uh, there are some inscription, they say that is Gudaraya, it's uh, improved. And in Akbar's court, we know that there were different departments. Somebody was expert of faces, somebody was landscape, somebody was something else. So it actually, one piece, uh, you know, from the master's line drawing, it moves all the way to four or five hands, and then finally master corrects. So this makes very fast. And that actually also gives a lot of uh, sub-styles or different of style. So, and in uh, sculpture, when we discuss, we generally discuss, you know, it's, in, it's a kind of in-house discussion, my father, my brother, and myself. Then, uh, when we talked about the sculpture, one thing uh, we were not we were very convinced, the space. 
If you have a pillar or if you have a sculpture, not more than three people, I suppose, can work together. Whereas in painting, you know, one, one color was done and then it was passed over that. So here uh, is your answer, you know. For sculpture, it might take uh, longer, but I was in uh, with Professor Don Statner in LA, and I was, I've been working on very interesting subject, which you will help me, about Buddha's robe. Why it is on one uh, right shoulder, why it's left, and why it's wrapped. And I found many interesting things. There I found there were some royal orders. Just one <laughs> minute. <laughs> and it's very interesting because that says, you know, for the walls, they were, the, the patron wanted to paint the wall of a pagoda. He hired 500 painters at a time. And here in Mughal court, uh, in Akbar's period, we know there were more than 125 painters working at a time. Keith, do you have any um, insights about how it's, it's different or in China? Uh, the Shang Tang Shan example is, is interesting because it dates to the Northern Xi. We know that the entire project was done within the 27 years of that very brief dynasty. So likewise, things seem to have um, happened very quickly. Uh, Shang Tang Shan is also a special case because unlike um, earlier cave sites, um, more than half of the images at the north and south site of Shang Tang Shan were created as freestanding images, which would have made them much easier to produce more quickly by teams than by doing all of the work within the environment of the cave and using the, the matrix of the site as the only material for, for the sculpture. So it may have facilitated a much quicker production. The workmen are, are of course, anonymous. Uh, the capital moves um, to, yeah, modern-day Anyang, uh, just a couple of decades before the caves are opened. It's thought that um, the carvers who had been working at Luoyang, which is also not very far away, on the Lungmen Caves, may well have been brought to the new capital uh, so that they had a, a gang of experienced sculptors and cave designers uh, at their disposal to make sure that the work was done efficiently. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> The question is to Ken Rinpoche um, about the, um, the, tr the various traditions that view the life story of the Buddha as being more or less legendary. How much um, of that story is considered to be fact and actual historical events um, by certain traditions? And, which tr and what's the difference uh, between those traditions that look at the story as true fact and those that look at it more as a symbolic kind of hagiography. Yes, we <coughs> believe this not just a symbolics. They really actually happens. And uh, this not something not happened, it, it born not born from this, you know, the uh, his rib, her ribs, then just symbolics, then not doesn't work, then the with the teaching not reliable. This Buddha's case is special. You know, he is born in the, in the, in, the, in, in the, actually from the whole right you know, ribs. Then he is he's not like an ordinary being, so a special way to born there. He's not just symbolic. You know. That shows his you know, special beings. Then also he shows not just you know, ordinary beings, also, he's you know, really showing us how to live, how to grow in the world with uh, like uh, ordinary ways. Well, sometimes he shows his special super things. Sometimes he just shows mainly on uh, how we live in our life. So therefore, he's showing first he was born in the from his ribs. Uh, then he shows he's really doing hard. Works you know, six 
years hesitism. So then he looks like very, you know, skinny and almost dying. But those are, he has the meaning, purpose to help his disciple to you now learn to live, how to get there. So showing different way, you know, in your some special way there, you know, nothing solid in Buddhist way. Everything is dependent, independent, independently. So there nothing, you know, is impossible, not born from the, you know, her, uh, rat, you know, ribs, but possible this one. Also, you know, even you are you know, doing hard work, it's not impossible to become yourself. Buddha, like me, just I work harder this way, then it helps me to become Buddha. There's, so she's shown different way for us how to uh, follow his instruction. He's just, as I told earlier, he's like a, you know, Special, what could say, um, scientists or you know, special author. You know, he's really figure out how can help everyone, you know, from the bondage of the with the attachment angers. So it's not only symbolic. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you. I want to thank also Alexander Jarman and Brittany, Brittany Salliers and Patrick Coleman, who did all the hard work of organizing today's program. And I hope you all go off and enjoy the day, enjoy the galleries, and thank you again for being here. Thank you.